Well, my name is Noe Badillo, and I am an artist who has been working since 1994. Um, I went to high school in Seattle, Washington, grew up during the grunge era, started doing black and white photography when I was 15, and I really liked abstraction and photography and black and white photography. I was influenced by photographers such as Edward Weston and Minor White. I loved Ansel Adams' nature photography, and I used to go out on my own in the woods and just really it really like just opened my eyes to seeing the world in just a totally new way. Not only in a totally new way, but actually it felt like actually just taking the time to just look and see the world. I don't think we do that enough, you know, in our culture. You tend to get stereotyped as having like a, a staring problem or something if you look at something too long. But it's good to just really like look at the world and appreciate it for what it is. In uh, community college, I, I was in Prescott, Arizona. That's the first time I lived here. And I started doing drawing and painting. And I eventually moved and went to art school on the East Coast. Got to do a semester in Rome and just totally went head over heels about the Renaissance and uh, Leonardo and Caravaggio and architecture and all these things. And uh, when I came home, I started apprenticing with an amazing, extremely famous yet kind of like unknown name of an artist named Osvaldo Romberg. He's like, kind of like, oh my God, who is this guy? All of a sudden he has a show at the Museum of Modern Art. And, but I've never heard of his name kind of a thing because he's not highly advertised, but he's like amazing. So I apprenticed with him for like a year and I studied classical painting by master copying. Master copying, it's a method of teaching that the old masters did with their apprentices where you would study from a copy of one of the masters. In those days, it probably would have been your own master's work that you would do a study of on your own and try to reproduce what he does in order to learn his technique and how he or she paints, I should say. So I did the same thing and learned classical painting that way. And then also learned a lot about theoretical and conceptual art. After that, I eventually moved back to Tucson and then I did my Bachelor of Fine Arts at the U of A and then went on and did my master's in art history there. And I'm now doing my master's in art history, but more with a focus on architecture, theory and history of Baroque architecture. My dissertation's on a architect named Guarino Guarini. He's an architect from the Baroque period. It helps you learn how to do art to study art and what they knew about art and architecture um, in terms of just either their technique or the history of it. I just find the ideas and the concepts and the philosophy in it fascinating in and of itself. So art historians tend to delineate between periods, but um, you know, Picasso is one of the ones who's most known to go through different distinct periods. And in my current kind of real dark period that I entered, I call it the Tenebris period. And Tenebrism is known from uh, Caravaggio originally, the Baroque painter who kind of painted in the shadows and um, there's streaming light you know, through a window across the scene. But I entered the Tenebris period because for one thing, um, there kind of tended to be dark skies around us. And uh, the other thing was I kind of entered a dark period of my life because my mom passed away after a, a long 12 year bout with uh, Alzheimer's. And so I entered this kind of like brooding, dark, shadowy period. The period I came from before was what I considered a very kind of like out in the sunlight, a sense of like Mediterranean warm kind of light, but I think it's different here in Arizona than if you were like, you know, in Italy or something, but we still have a lot of beautiful light here, the, the sun and the warmth of the desert and everything. And I think a lot of that kind of permeated the sense of how I expressed myself at that time. A lot of floral pieces, paintings of my family out in the sun and in kind of bathed in that light and expressiveness. Just last year I started sculpting marble. I did a little work with ceramic and clay when I was younger, um, but I never really did like a lot of real figurative uh, sculpture in clay or bronze. This is Napoleon gray marble. It's a bit harder than uh, like Carrara marble, which is like what Michelangelo used for the, for the Pieta, that nice white creamy marble. Um, but I'm just working with this because it's just what I have and it's good. And My favorite, a medium in art is probably oil painting these days, but I want to head more into sculpture as time goes on. I tend to use some untraditional mediums and it, what it comes out of besides just trying to be uh, clever or um, you know, alternative medium, alternative medium just to try something new, it's actually become more of like out of necessity. I mean, as a starting, starving artist, um, when I was living off of you know, uh, boiled beans and um, $40 a month as a food budget. I'd use cardboard to paint on, and I still do sometimes. And uh, you can see a couple pieces of mine 
on my website that have that are uh, done on cardboard. And honestly, some of my best works on cardboard, some of the great masters of history have used cardboard, including um, Vincent van Gogh and Picasso and Toulouse-Lautrec. It's a great medium to work on anyway. Instead of paint, I've painted with coffee, I've painted with tea, I've painted with uh, red wine. Sometimes you can take a, uh, an old felt tip pen, especially the kind that have a little bit of, a, of an ease to them, that they're kind of like a brush, um, and keep using it. You know, dip it in ink, dip it in watercolor, and still use it as a brush. Um, you know, I've drawn with a stick in the mud. It's not, it comes out of just um, necessity. I think creativity is often born out of necessity, you know? One of the pieces I do where I use coffee as a medium is of Elizabeth. If I remember correctly, I also use gesso. For the highlighted part, it's more of like a, a warm white tone. Gesso is uh, usually used as a, as a paint primer. Um, people use acrylic gesso a lot these days and you prime wood or canvas or whatever you're painting on with gesso. Another medium I think I used in that piece was when I sculpt marble, I try not to waste that either. I will take the, uh, the, the marble dust and the chunks that fall off and I'll use the dust for things, um, for me even painting, to give paint texture. Uh, you can even use it as part of a ground, like a gesso, or an intonico layer of fresco, like, like the Renaissance artist used. This is Elliot. So this is Elliot when he was younger, on that part. And this is Griffin, right here. And that's Mom. And that's Mommy. And this is new Theo. He's been born since then. Ever since we got married and had kids, they've been my, like my sole subject almost in my work. And they really represent to me kind of an allegory of, uh, of the Holy Family, of the sacred family, and of the importance of family. So they're like in all my work. You think of Renaissance art, classical art, and like religious art, Catholic art or Christian art, as like really halos and gold and glittery and all that stuff. My work, especially these days, tends to be a very like toned down kind of realistic, not only realistic in terms of like realism technique, but like uh, the reality of life. So a lot of the paintings won't necessarily have um, sparkly halos and um, angels and wings and stuff, but more like the raw reality of life. And that comes out of kind of the 19th century idea of uh, French realism. My work kind of represents that genre more, I think. My kids are amazing at art. Both my sons, Elliot and Griffin, are really getting into it. You know, Theo is still pretty young, but he's starting to eat crayons at least. If you know, he's not drawing with them all the time. My painting's Spigasaurus. I always encourage them to, to paint with me. If we're not, we're out here, we're painting in the, we, we paint inside and they have their own little toy easel and stuff too, so. Art plays two different roles. It can be therapeutic, it, it's cathartic, it lets your emotions out, and it allows you to quiet your mind and externalize a lot of the things you struggle with in your mind and get it out onto the canvas or on paper. And I think it's been a big help for me too. More recently in my work, um, what I want people to get out of it is, it comes out of kind of a dark place, but I want to build a sense of strength. And in that sense of strength, there's a sense of humanity that I want to convey and the importance of family and children in the world and human life and dignity throughout my life. As my life has changed, my work changes, but I tend not to consider who I know myself to be as an artist. A lot of times people associate who someone is as an artist with you know, an image or a style that they represent. To me, that's more like a surface presentation or a social persona. So for me, there's an underlying meaning to all of this that maybe is just a bit more complicated to figure out than that. And I would say dabbling into different mediums is simply just exploring different ways to express myself. Through my website, there's examples of my work over the last 20 years or so. There's also lots of links to academic articles and such that I've published in journals. Also, if you sign up for my mailing list, you get 20% off your first artwork purchase. And I have a blog that you can read too. I love working here in Chandler, and uh, if, any, if anyone who's local or anyone in Phoenix at all, or even from LA who's visiting or whatever, uh, wants to come by and do a studio visit, anyone's welcome to stop by for coffee and uh, check out my work. There's plenty of stuff to collect and for sale and um, just arrange it through my website and you can come by anytime. Meet the kids, meet uh, Elizabeth and everything. So 
You're welcome. Yeah.